Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Luke Chatham. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, we look back at stories from our Washington, D.C. Bureau, from the creation of a new museum to recognize Latino Americans to gun reform efforts on Capitol Hill. The Smithsonian Institution already operates museums for African Americans and American Indians, and a new museum that will recognize the history of American Latinos took its first steps towards opening this summer, as Daisy Gonzalez Perez reports from our Washington Bureau. They may look like a pair of dusty shoes and a battered backpack, but the Smithsonian items are also the seeds for the future National Museum of the American Latino. The museum will help visitors understand how Latinos have contributed and continue to contribute to U.S. art, history, culture, and science. We all recognize that our children need to see themselves in a gallery, and certainly we at America agree that Latino history is American history and we want to show um, that we've pretty much always have been here. But the museum itself is still years and millions of dollars away. For now, it is represented by a National Museum of American History exhibit called Presente. The display, which opened in late June, is the first physical evidence of what will become the full museum. It includes the Reebok, backpack, and an MP3 player left in the Sonoran Desert by a migrant. These are found objects that were found in the Arizona desert. It tells a very <clears throat> difficult story because we know of the many people who perished trying to cross the desert in Arizona who didn't make it. Immigration is just one of the themes of Presente. It also looks at colonization, culture, and identity. For visitors like Michael Lopez of New York, it's about time. I think that it is fantastic and it's overdue. I'm, I'm really happy that the United States is really recognizing the, the contributions that the Latinos have made within the United States. The museum was first proposed seven years ago, but a bill calling for the Smithsonian to establish it was not passed until December 2020. That just started the long process of finding a site, raising funds, and building a museum. But Dia said the final product will be worth it. I come in here and actually learn about our presence and our contributions. If they come away with a sense of that, then I think we will have achieved some success. This particular exhibit will be here for the next two years, where themes will change throughout. The actual museum has plans to find a permanent home within the next 10 to 12 years. In Washington, Daisy Gonzalez Perez, Cronkite News. The National Museum of the American Latino is expected to cost $600 million or more, and half of that amount has to be raised privately. Alarming, severe, historic. Those were some of the words senators used last week to describe the drought in the West. Now, while they all agreed that state and federal officials need to cooperate if things are ever going to get better, an Arizona senator demanded to know if everybody's cooperating as much as they should. Elsa Horteris breaks down the issues from us from our D.C. Bureau. Arizona Senator Mark Kelly had a lot of questions at a recent Senate Energy and Natural Resources hearing, but it all boiled down to this. Is everybody doing their fair share? And Arizona's done everything that Arizona has been asked. And he had a specific question for Bureau of Reclamation Commissioner Camille Tootin. If Basin states cannot reach an agreement, is the department prepared to take actions to impose restrictions on other states without regard to river priority? Tootin didn't say yes, but she didn't say no, telling Kelly that the Bureau is still working with all states on a deal. Yes, we will protect the system but we're not at that decision point yet. The negotiations came as drought across the West has led to record lows in the Colorado River. Lakes Mead and Powell have reached levels that triggered the first phase of drought planning with projections calling for levels to get lower. Future water projections in this basin also look grim. And if water levels continue to decline, it would trigger the most severe water cuts for the Southwest. 
the hearing included a range of possible measures to mitigate the drought from desalination to drip irrigation. But every solution came with its own set of problems, and officials called for more data to help decide what to do. That doesn't mean they're waiting to act. Tootin pointed to the $8 billion fund for drought response that was included in the recent infrastructure bill, money she intends to see spent. What, what I will say, Senator, is I'll spend the bipartisan infrastructure law money to make sure that we're meeting the goals as Congress intended, but also to provide sustainability in the West. One thing they all agreed on is the need for everybody to cooperate. And we're going to continue to step up here, but we need partners and long-term commitments from the federal government. Answers could be coming soon. Tootin said the Board of Reclamation expects to make its yearly forecast this August. Elsa Horteris, Washington, Cronkite News. In an effort to, as Senator Mark Kelly said, do their fair share, numerous Arizona cities, including Tucson and Phoenix, have entered stage one water restrictions. The committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol continued its hearings today. Members laid out a timeline of pressure that the Trump White House exerted trying to get state officials to overturn the 2020 election. And Arizona House Speaker Rusty Bowers was a key witness. As Daisy Gonzalez Perez reports from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. Even before he could begin his testimony today, Arizona House Speaker Rusty Bowers had to deal with more rumors from former President Donald Trump who claimed in a statement today that Bauer said Trump won in 2020. Bowers had a blunt response. Anywhere, anyone, anytime has said that I said the election was rigged, that would not be true. That set the tone for the hearing in which Bowers testified to repeated efforts by Trump and his lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, to reverse the election. Bowers said he repeatedly asked for evidence from the Trump team, but that they could never produce it. At some point, did uh, one of them uh, make a comment that uh, they didn't have evidence, but they had a lot of theories? That was Mr. Giuliani. And what exactly did he say and how that came up? My recollection, he said, we've got lots of theories, we just don't have the evidence. Bowers said the calls from the White House began just days after the election and continued through January 6th with legal theories that were increasingly far-fetched. Well... I thought of the book, The Gang That Couldn't Shoot Straight, and I just thought, this is a, this is a tragic parody. He also said he was contacted by Arizona Congressman Andy Biggs on January 6, who asked him to support a challenge to the election on the same day it was being certified. And I said I would not. Bowers, like other witnesses from Georgia, testified to a campaign of harassment after the election receiving thousands of emails and voicemail messages and protesting outside his house regularly. But Bauer said he was only following the Constitution, what he called a divinely inspired document, and following the law to uphold the election results. I do not want to be a winner by cheating. I will not play with laws I swore allegiance to. In Washington, Daisy gonzalez Perez. Cronkite News. We reached out to Congressman Andy Biggs's office for comment on Bowers' claim that Biggs contacted him on January 6th, but we haven't yet heard back from them. After mass shootings in Buffalo and Texas, calls for gun control are being raised again in Washington, and advocates from Arizona in the nation's capital this week to press lawmakers on the issue. Elsa Hortereas has more from our Washington Bureau. 11 years after she was severely wounded in a mass shooting in Tucson, former Arizona Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords was back in Washington again to push Congress to act on gun reform. We must never stop fighting. Fight, fight, fight. Giffords joined lawmakers and advocates today on the National Mall, where over 45,000 vases with flowers were planted to represent victims of gun violence. 5,000 flowers are orange, to represent the most recent gun violence. The rally comes amid a new push for gun control here after mass shootings at a grocery store in Buffalo killed 10 and a school shooting in Texas killed 19 children and two teachers. There are a lot of very scared parents and kids out there today. Today's rally was highlighted by leaders of gun reform movements such as March for Our Lives and politicians who spoke about how gun violence has affected their lives. 
since my son Jordan was taken from me from unnecessary gun violence simply for playing loud music in his car. Both the House and Senate are considering gun control bills, but Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal, a longtime advocate for such measures, told the crowd it won't be easy. We still have an uphill battle, but we are determined to seize this moment and save lives because we have a responsibility. Giffords, who has been an advocate since the 2011 Tucson shooting that killed six people and wounded her and 12 others, called on lawmakers to do the right thing. Stopping gun violence takes courage. After a marathon hearing last week, the House Judiciary Committee gave preliminary approval on a bill that would raise the age limit to buy a gun, limit ammunition magazines, and more. That bill could come to the House this week. Elsa Horteris, Cronkite News. Today's rally came less than a week after President Joe Biden's emotional primetime speech on gun violence in which he called on lawmakers to quote, just do something. Connecticut Senator Murphy briefed the president this morning on a bipartisan push for gun reform in the Senate. Discussions about how to reduce gun violence have been a constant in Congress since the Uvalde shooting earlier this month. This week, Phoenix Police Chief Jerry Williams made a plea to the Senate Judiciary Committee for responsible gun control. Elsa Orteras in our D.C. Bureau spoke with Chief Williams. Phoenix Chief of Police Jerry Williams told the Senate committee that the time to start protecting victims of tomorrow is today. Because today's suspects is often tomorrow's victim. Williams' comments came during a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing Wednesday on protecting children from gun violence. A hearing that came just weeks after a gunman walked into Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas and killed 19 children and two teachers. One theme that kept coming up throughout the hearing is that the problem of gun violence from mass shootings to suicides is often a mental health problem. A recent study of school shootings showed that 100% of school shooters had experienced significant childhood trauma. Schlage said that can create a cycle of violence that those who grow up witnessing violence often are more likely to be involved in crime later in life. Trauma is the obvious result of gun violence, but it's also a root cause of gun violence as well. While she recommended mental health care, Schlage said other steps should be taken, including reduced access to guns and safe gun storage. Williams agreed that improvements in mental health care are needed, but said more police resources are needed too, as well as gun policy changes across the board. I think it needs to be federal change. I think it needs to be state changes. I think it needs to be local changes. I think we as Americans need to come together and really do something about this, and I'm confident that we'll be able to. The hearing comes as the Senate is about to take up a package of gun reform bills in response to the shootings in Uvalde and Buffalo. Elsa Horteris, Washington, D.C., Cronkite News. The experts agree that curbing mass shootings isn't a one-issue problem. Gun control and mental health resources are needed. Today's decision by the United States Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, which has determined access to abortions for the past 50 years. The news was not a surprise after a leaked memo showed an early draft last month. Hundreds gathered at the Supreme Court in Washington. Daisy Gonzalez-Perez was there and brings us the reaction. The Supreme Court today ruled that there is no constitutional right to an abortion, overruling its 1973 Roe v. Wade decision and saying the decision on an abortion restriction must be returned. That ruling was greeted with chairs by the hundred of anti-abortion protesters outside the court who have been waiting decades for this day to come. That's been on America for almost 50 years has now been lifted and the real work begins. We know over 20 states are going to go back to their laws pre row which is a protection of life. For anti-abortion right activists, this ruling came as a shock. Like many in the crowd, Chandler resident Caitlin, who did not want to give her last name, said it was an emotional moment. Being at home, I didn't realize that. I knew that it was important to me. I didn't know how important it was. But being here, I, it truly is a right that they're taking away from us. But I think we need to change. I think, I think the courts need to change. Many of the abortion right protesters here expected the court might narrow road, but the 6-3 decision by Justice Samuel Alito said there has never been a constitutional right to an abortion. Roe was, quote, egregiously wrong from the start and must be overruled, he wrote. 
and abortion decisions should be returned to the states. There's one thing both sides appear to agree on today. The battle over abortion will now move to state legislatures. And Tempe native Katie Bennon Cohen said it does not mean the end to abortion in the U.S. for the millions who could be affected by the court's ruling. The reality is that there are plenty of women in the United States that will continue to have access to abortions, but it is in the most unbelievably discriminatory way that does violence to the very idea of equality in the United States. At the Supreme Court, Daisy gonzalez Perez, Cronkite News. It's been two weeks now since the U.S. Supreme Court said the Constitution does not provide the right to an abortion. But the outcry from abortion rights supporters continues to grow. Daisy Gonzalez Perez from our Washington Bureau spoke with some activists and supporters at a march on Saturday. They chanted, they marched, some tied themselves to the White House fence. Ought to tell President Joe Biden he has to do more to protect abortion rights. The Supreme Court Dobbs ruling said it is up to states to set abortion laws, not the federal government. Chandler resident Ellie Sims said that made it important for her to turn out. And I recently moved to D.C. from Arizona, and while my right to an abortion is safe here in D.C., I know that my, my sisters and my trans friends at home are not safe. Um, and while I can sit here comfortably, relatively comfortably, I know that my rights could be taken in any split second. A pouring rain did not deter a crowd estimated to be in the thousands for Saturday's Summer of Rage March. Rain didn't stop them and neither did barricades. While many gathered around Lafayette Square, others pushed up to the White House fence, waving signs and tying bands off our bodies bandanas to the fence. The march came a day after the president signed an executive order aimed at safeguarding access to reproductive health services, including protections for abortion medications and for patients to travel to other states for care. Sims, a student at Georgetown, calls that a good start. Biden's executive order was a good start. It was necessary. He's going to sit here and do something symbolic. He needs to use every ounce of power he has. He needs to push the limits of presidential power. But others, like Wendy Hidalgo of Northern Virginia, said much more is needed. I think it was less than we were asking for, and I think it was to try to appease people. But I don't think that it's going to do much in terms of what's happening in this country, and he needs to be much more forceful in what he's doing. And no counter protesters were in evidence. The rally was over in less than an hour and a half, but organizers promise it is just the beginning of many more protests to come. I want my grandchildren to have the same choice as I did, and I'm here with my daughter, who I had by choice because I had a choice, and I want her children to have a choice. In Washington, Daisy Gonzalez Perez, Cronkite News. President Biden was not at the White House for the protest, but was at his home in Delaware this weekend. He told reporters Sunday that abortion rights groups should keep protesting to put pressure on states and Congress. Biden said he is also considering whether he can declare a public health emergency over abortion access. A lot of things changed during the pandemic, none more so than tourism, but some things at least are going back to normal. Alexia Stanbridge in our DC Bureau has more. There's a lot to see in Washington, but for the past two years, one of its highlights, the United States Capitol itself has been off limits, but that changed just in time for some lucky Arizonans. Oh, we're excited and happy that it's finally back open to the public. COVID was the first hit to Capitol tourism, followed by last year's attack on the Capitol itself. And when tours finally began again, they had to be arranged through a congressional office. This group of 15 Arizonans applied right as Congressman Greg Stanton's office was resuming tours. About a week before our tour, like, wait, this would be really cool if we could do this, saw that it was open again, emailed our congressman and we were able to get in. Tourists aren't the only ones who are happy about the reopening of the Capitol. It means a lot for the city's tourism industry as well. The Capitol building reopening is really a part of the experience for so many people that are coming uh, to Washington. Ferguson says domestic travel is saving a lot of major cities like D.C. Tourism was worth $8 billion to Washington in 2019 and supported about 80,000 jobs, he says. While the pandemic took a toll on the industry, Ferguson says things are looking good. Where we are today versus two years ago and a year ago, 
a lot of optimism in Washington, D.C. After their tour, the group was not disappointed. The highlight for sure, and we've done a lot of stuff here. This was my favorite by far. Scott Smith, who booked a tour through Congressman Tom O'Halloran's office, said he agrees, even though things are a little different than the last time he visited. And it's a little bit more restricted now, so we were just really honored to be able to get a tour through the congressman's office. The tourists I spoke with said it's important to contact your representative early because this is a tour you don't want to miss. I would say even if you're not into politics, Politics. I think it's just the art, the, sh the statue, just a little history. I think it's beautiful. The Capitol is not the only place off limits to tourists. The White House was closed too, but tourists can now book tours there too through the representative's office. In Washington, Alexia Stambridge, Cronkite News. While most of Washington is welcoming visitors again, not everything's open. The Smithsonian's popular Air and Space Museum is closed this summer, not for COVID, but for a $250 million renovation. It's set to reopen in the fall. Do you know how to spell definitely? You might not, but a sixth grader from Prescott definitely does. And she's spelling herself closer and closer to victory. Daisy Gonzalez Perez in our DC Bureau has more. Alina Alford spends hours a day studying for the last four years to get here, the Scripps National Spelling Bee in Washington, D.C. For the last few months, I've been doing one-on-one uh, -on -one quizzing with my dad, about three hours a day of that, because uh, we had to finish a list in a certain amount of time. That work paid off. After two days of competition this week, Aaliyah has been able to advance to tonight's semifinals. But it hasn't been easy. Yes. Dyspathy. D Y S P A T H Y. Dyspathy. Congrats, Aaliyah. That is correct. It was no surprise to Brenda Alpert, who said Aaliyah has been working hard with her dad to get ready. Her dad has been the more day to day. Um, what would you call it? Uh, I guess slave unofficial driver? spelling coach or slave driver. <laughs> After spelling nuciform and defining malinger on Tuesday, 11-year-old Aaliyah spelled Krupus this morning to make it to the semifinals. One of just 48 remaining from the original 229 contestants, organizers praised her poise. And, uh, yeah, I, she has appeared very confident, yeah. The Prescott homeschooler who beat out 26 other students in the state competition to get here is not sure she'll be back next year, but she does have advice for future spelling bee competitors. Study hard and take your time more than I did because I was working, uh, which I should know. Leah is the only speller from Arizona, but she said she is excited to represent Arizona for as long as she can. At National Harbor in Maryland, Daisy Gonzalez Perez for Cronkite News. Since Daisy filed that report, Aaliyah has made it through the first two rounds of the semifinals by correctly spelling Osmark and defining Veer Klempt. If she makes it through tonight, she'll be in the finals tomorrow and we'll be watching. A local stage production makes it all the way to New York for a run off Broadway. It's a dream come true, sort of. For the Arizona Dreamer who inspired the story behind Americano, there are still more goals. Cronkite News reporter Daisy Gonzalez Perez reports from behind the scenes curtain in New York City. Tony Valdovino's story has taken him from Phoenix to off Broadway and has given him the chance to meet with Barack Obama and Hamilton creator Lynn Manuel Miranda. But for Valdovino, that's not the most important part of his story. DACA has been a saving grace. Every two years, I am very excited to reapply. It is a safety factor, uh, and it is the ability to continue trying to represent ourselves and try and get to a permanent solution. But DACA was not around when Valdivinos, inspired in the wake of 9-11, tried to join the Marines at age 17. That's when he learned he was not a U.S. citizen. And I was told that I was wasting their time. I was very confused by that experience. and. Uh, uh, I just saw, uh, I went back home in, in embarrassment, anger, and uh, just wanting to get it fixed out. It hurt more to hear that news from the recruiter, not from his family. The truth was revealed that day uh, from my mother and uh, told us that we were never part of a process in the United States. So That story became the basis for Americano, the off-Broadway musical that has let Valdovinos continue to tell his story. Through actor Sean Ewing, who plays Tony on stage. I know it is, in some people's perspective, a, just a show, 
but in my eyes as the artist, um, I have the, the ability to affect an entire theater. I guess in a way I am canvassing. I am giving the message out to hundreds of people every single night. For Valdivinos, that canvassing began years ago in Arizona. It was there that he met then President Barack Obama. I had shared my story when I met him uh, in 2012. We had asked him for help. He told us to organize. Obama recently met with the cast of Americano to discuss the 10th anniversary of DACA. You know, it was incredible to meet with him. It was incredible to talk with him. But it was also a stark reality that uh, we have a tremendous way to go. Americano's off-Broadway run ended Sunday. But it's not the end of Valdivino's story, which he hopes will be retold. The idea is to get to Broadway, and uh, that's our biggest hope, is just give us a shot to Broadway. In New York City, Daisy gonzalez Bettis, Cronkite News. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thank you for joining us. And for top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.